So we're going to get started. My name is Terry McHugh and I'm the Executive Director of Community Relations for School District 54. I work with school psychologist Meg Kwok to coordinate the Schomburg Parent University courses that we offer to families throughout the year. Schomburg Parent University was started in September 2007 to strengthen family relationships and help children achieve the goal of academic success as well as social emotional well-being. However, tonight we are hosting our very first virtual event. Welcome everyone. Um, if you love this presentation and you want to share it with friends and family, please note that a recording will be posted on our website at sd54.org slash SPU. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce licensed clinical social worker, Alex Gorham. Alex has been with Stenzel Clinical for over two years. He is their clinical business development liaison and one of their supervisors as well. He specializes in working with children, teens, and families. Thank you, Alex, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. Uh, part of what I do here is stuff like this. One thing that we value quite a lot at Stenzel is being able to partner with schools, partner with other organizations in the communities that we serve for the purpose of helping everybody live well. So if you can see on the screen, our tagline is find hope, live well, which I really like. So Grant, our owner, did a great job coming up with that. But that's really the goal of what we do. And so I have a lot packed uh, in this hour. So hopefully you guys are ready for a fun and exciting ride. All right. So today we're gonna to be focusing on family togetherness. And this is really all about what does it mean to be there and to be present with your kid? Um, and so let's kind of go over the objectives for tonight. So we're gonna learn more about what is resilience and what is anxiety. We're gonna learn more about how to understand what your kid might need from you. We're gonna look at uh, some practical ways to respond to anxiety. And we will also have a chance to ask questions. And so what we're gonna do is if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat box on the screen. And we will have a time for a question and answers at the end of the presentation. Uh, Cause often what happens is I might answer one of your questions as I continue. And uh, also, if you have a question, most likely there's another parent that has a similar question, so don't be afraid to ask. All right, let's get started. So what is resilience? So you might be wondering, why do I have a picture of somebody lifting weights? We will get to that in a quick second. But let's focus on what resilience is. Oh, let me move my camera. So resilience is really the process of how we deal with adversity, trauma, or significant stress. Resilience is something that can be reinforced or built up. And the American Psychological Association gives four areas of focus in terms of how to build up resilience. And so the four things are, one is connection. Connection is really all about how do we connect with other people in our lives? So for a parent, it might be how do you connect with your significant other? How do you connect with your child? For your kids, it might be how do they connect with their friends, with maybe somebody on the team there, on the sport team they might be on. Uh, that's connection. Two is wellness. Wellness is all about making healthy choices. So the whole idea is how do we make healthy choices where we can improve how we feel. So a lot of this comes down to using healthy coping skills. Uh, three is healthy thinking. Healthy thinking is really all about attitude. So what we know is that when there's an ad attitude plays a significant role in how we perceive a situation. And so having things like positive self-talk go a long way in healthy thinking. And four is meaning. Meaning is often connected to kind of perfect this is often also connected to uh, if you uh, believe in a certain faith or if you practice a, a certain spiritual belief. Uh, meaning comes down to what is your purpose, your goal in life. And so focusing on these four areas allow you to build your resilience. And the more, the more you work on building up your resilience, the more you'll be able to handle in terms of trauma, stress. And we all know that 2020 has been a, quite a unique year. 
and I'm afraid that it's not quite over. And so as we continue to move forward and kind of persevere in this difficult time, focusing on connection, wellness, healthy thinking, and meaning, meaning can help us grow on our resilience. And so we go back to the picture. So I got into something called CrossFit. CrossFit is a type of workout, it's a gym. And what I realized is that after my first time working out, this is a few months ago, I like could not move for like two or three days. I cannot believe that my body hurt so much. And so I had the option. I could have quit and said, I don't want to do this. Or I could have done, I'm going to keep going. So I kept going. And so even here we are two months later, even though I still don't look like the rock, you know, I can actually work out and my body doesn't hurt as much after I work out. So the whole idea is as we work on things, the growing process the building up our resilience can be uncomfortable, can be difficult. But just because there is discomfort and difficulty doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. One thing that you'll probably learn about me through this presentation is I'm super visual. And so if you like that, that's great. I have a lot of metaphors that I use to kind of help explain some of these concepts. And I'm not sure if we have any kids watching, so hopefully they will enjoy that as well. So here is uh, resilience. Here's a metaphor that I came up with. So if we have any kids watching, I want you guys to go and grab your favorite stuffed animal. I grabbed mine from home. So this is a little monkey. I got this monkey. My parents got this monkey for me for one of my cleft palate operations when I was a little kid. And so what we will do, if you don't have a stuffed animal, go ahead and grab like a sports ball, okay? Like a soft one. And so here's how Oh, and if you don't have any kids watching, mom and dad, you can kind of explain this concept to your child later on. So what happens in life is sometimes we feel like life puts pressure on us, right? Or we feel like we get squished. So here's a little, I'll call him Curious George just for the sake of it. Here's a little George and he's getting all squished, right? And it probably doesn't feel very comfortable, right? And sometimes we feel like we're getting really stressed, right? I don't want to pull too hard because I don't want to hurt him too much, right? But we get stressed, right? And we know the curious George can be kind of curious and getting in some tough places, right? Um, and so what happens with resilience is resilience is the ability for us to go from being squished to not being squished, right? And so it's a little example of the little balls getting squished. And then again, resilience helps us get back to our normal shape or our normal size. All right, so now I have another metaphor for us to kind of uh, use and go through. So this is the water bucket metaphor. So I don't know if any of us have been to a water park. I worked as a lifeguard for quite a few years. And so I've been to water parks where they have these really big buckets, right? And the bucket fills with water. And as soon as it uh, fills completely over, it dumps over and it spills, right? Um, and so this is one way of understanding resilience and anxiety. And so what it is, is the water bucket, the bucket represents our resilience. The bigger the bucket, the more it can handle, right? Some people have bigger buckets and some people have smaller buckets. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing. That's just what it is. We were all created different. But the cool thing is, is we can actually upgrade our buckets to larger sizes as we focus on things like, you know, healthy thinking, you know, meaning, connection. The bigger the bucket, the more difficult situations we can handle. And the water in the bucket represents anxiety, it represents adversity, trauma, and stress. So if we look at the year 2020, right, and we kind of have our buckets, right, we can put COVID into it, we can put maybe if we have somebody that we care about got sick, we can put some civil unrest in that bucket. Our buckets is getting pretty full. And so what happens is, is that if we don't have healthy ways to release the stress, the bucket will eventually overflow and we kind of get into this crisis mode. And what we want to do is we want to build in kind of like a little drain um, at the bottom of the bucket to release some of the water so it prevents the whole bucket from dumping over. All right, now we're going to move on to what is anxiety? Um, anxiety is pretty cool um, in terms of, it's really complex, right? Uh, I have a, quite a few clients that I work with that have anxiety. Um, and when I said cool, I didn't mean cool. I meant like the brain biology behind how our brains work. 
And so biology is a combination of two different things. Um, anxiety is biology, and biology is something that we don't have control over. Uh, biology is something um, that we're all born with. You know, we live in an imperfect world. Sometimes people have cancer, sometimes people have diabetes, sometimes people have anxiety. And that's something that we don't do to create. It's just something that happens in our brains. And then we have this idea of the environment, right? And so the environment are things that impact how we deal with something, right? Is our family life, is our school life, our work life. Uh, if we're in a significant relationship, that's our environment, right? So that's kind of a immediate environment. And then we have something called the bigger, the macro environment, which is things that happen in our school district. So things that happen in Illinois or the country or the world as a whole. And so the whole idea of anxiety is, is a combination of biology and the environment. And the combination of these two lead to what your anxiety might look like. And there's another uh, another uh, aspect to anxiety is your uh, neurotransmitters. So your brain has seven classes of uh, neurotransmitters, and there are two classes that are really abundant in your brain. And the way that I help my clients understand this concept is I use a stoplight. And so you have this chemical called GABA, and that is your stop signal. So this is a neurotransmitter that is released in your brain that tells you to kind of stop, slow down, kind of relax, right? And then you have this other chemical called glutamate, which is your go, go, go signal. And so what happens sometimes in life from a biological point of view is that sometimes people don't have enough of the stop signal, the GABA neurotransmitter releasing the brain. And so they tend to be kind of stuck on go more often than not, which increases your anxiety. Other times, uh, what happens is people might have too much GABA in their brain and they kind of feel kind of slow and they kind of feel stuck. And that's where we have sometimes a bit more depression. Of course, you know, neurobiology is a lot more complex than red light, green light but hopefully you guys understand the concept. And so there are things that we can do to help offset some of the biological uh, factors that we might be dealing with. So for one example for GABA is there's a medication called gabapentin. And gabapentin actually has more than one pur purpose. It has a purpose for, I think it's a cardiac drug that we can give for blood pressure, but it's also a medication that we can give to help lower anxiety. And when it does it, it increases the amount of GABA that your brain has available uh, to use. And so again, there are things that we can do to help impact, limit the impact that our biology plays on our anxiety. All right, so this is another fun metaphor. I often use this with teenagers, especially if they're learning to drive. Uh, so we have the intersection metaphor. And so the stoplight is the biology. That is the signal. So when you think about driving down whatever road that you're driving down, right? We don't really control when the light turns red or when the light turns green, right? That's the biology. We don't have too much control over that, right? And the weather and the traffic, the time of day, the road conditions, that is all the environment. So the environment actually impacts the way that we respond to the biology. And what we can do is once we recognize that we're gonna be in a stressful moment, we can then be proactive in trying to help lower our anxiety. So for example, if we stick with this driving metaphor, right? Uh, say that, um, you know, uh, say that it's snowing and it's nighttime, right? So we know there's a lot of stress, the road conditions are slippery, the, t the visibility is not really good. So we have that kind of environment impacting. So now we have a choice to make. We can make the choice of slowing down our speed, giving more space, right? We can't control the snow, right? We can't control the time of day, but what we can control is how we respond to what's happening in our environment, how we can respond to what's happening in the biology of our brain. There we go. All right, so now as we move on, we're gonna focus on what does your child need from you? This is your, I love talking with parents uh, in my sessions about how can you support your child? So there's this idea of being the perfect parent and I came up with an acronym called being the star parent. The reality is, is that there, 
Um, to be a star in your kid's eye, you do not have to be a superhero. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. Um, sometimes you might think that we are, uh, but in reality, that's not what you know, that's not really what it is, right? And so the key is not about how do you be a superhero, it's about how can you be a star in your kid's eye, right? We all make mistakes. One of the great things I tell parents in my sessions is give yourself permission to not be perfect. Um, and it's okay not to have the right answers, not to have all the answers. That's not what your job is. And so you might be thinking, what does STAR stand for? Well, great question. Let's go into that. So S stands for being supportive. Um, being supportive means validating your child's emotion. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be right and you have to tell your child that they're right or that they're wrong. Validating emotion implies that you can understand and you verbalize to your child, hey buddy, I see what you're feeling. I see that you're struggling. And it's not about being right or being wrong. It's about being there present emotionally and validating their feelings. Being timely is a big one. Timely is all about being res uh, about responding in a way that is immediate. Um, you know, so if you see your kids struggling on Monday, don't wait till Friday to be like, hey, how was your week? You know, well, in reality, she probably picked up, but they had a tough week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So being timely is being able to pick up on, hey, right now, this is what's happening in the moment. Oftentimes, anxiety is caused by two things. We either jump into the future and we get scared of the unknown, or we go back into the past and we get anxious about things that we can't change from the past. So a big theme of timely is how do we be present in this moment? We're not going to focus on the past. We're not going to focus on the future. We're going to focus on the here and now. Uh, a stands for being assertive. Uh, so really, this, what this means is uh, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And sometimes this goes both ways in terms of positive encouragement, but also it comes to if you have to redirect your child, if you have to give them a, uh, a punishment or a consequence for something that um, they did that was not a healthy choice. And the last one is being R. Being R is being responsive. So what that means is as we learn, as we go on life, things change, right? So if we look at COVID, for example, you know, what we knew about COVID back in March is not really necessarily what we know now, right? As things change, our responses also change. And that's really what it means about to be responsive. Is as we go on, as we learn more about school, as we learn more about what's going on, we're gonna make appropriate changes to meet that, cha to meet that um, need in the moment. So that is what it means to be a star parent. So we're going to focus on what do you want to avoid. So I have two pieces of advice for you guys. So one is don't ask why. I would probably say this is one of the biggest things I tell parents or pretty much anybody is when we ask why, it really gives um, other people a feeling of defensiveness. Um, I, only, I learned about this quite a while ago, but I went to a leadership summit um, about two years ago and they had um, the head FBI of 24 years, like the head negotiator. And I was so excited to hear him say this very same thing, that he said that in negotiations, he never asked the word why, because he recognized that why increases people's sense of feeling defensive. Even though that's not your intention, that's what happens. And so when we ask our kids, why, um, why are you feeling something, they might not know. And the other piece of advice I have for you guys is it's okay not to have all the answers for your kids. Again, as we kind of went over why, it makes you, you what happens is when you ask your child, hey, why are you feeling sad? They might not know what they are feeling or why they are feeling that. And so being asked a question can actually increase their anxiety because they don't understand. If we kind of go back to the water bucket, analogy, let's say their water bucket has been filling for the past six months and it took a little tiny thing to cause the whole thing to dump over. Asking them in the moment, hey, why did the bucket spill over? They're not gonna have an idea and that's gonna increase their anxiety. Uh, again, it increases a defense response in our brains when we ask why. Um, and the child might also think you're not on their side. If they feel like they're being, you know, attacked or they have to defend themselves, they're gonna automatically put you against them. 
And the other question is why we don't want to use why is you might not be able to fix the problem. One of the big things I talk to parents about is you might not be able to fix the problem. With anxiety, we might not be able to control what is causing anxiety. The goal is being able to help your child navigate and respond to the anxiety. It's not about fixing the problem. It's about getting through the difficult time. So some better ideas instead of using why is using what or using I wonder. So I wonder, I would probably say is my favorite question I ask in therapy. I ask it with kids, I ask it with grownups, I ask it with teens. And what it is, it really is an open-ended question that allows your child to give you whatever answer that they want to give you. So for example, instead of using why, you know, say your kid comes home and they're really struggling, they come home, they, you know, kind of throw their bag, you know, on the floor and they kind of stomp off to their room, you follow them and you could say, hey, Billy, why are you mad? Or why did you do that? Well, that's going to elicit a negative response from Billy. He's going to be like, well, why are you in my face? I'm already feeling like, you know, not good. And they're going to kind of shut down more. So instead of using why, you can say, you know, hey, give them some time to kind of relax, cool down, take a quick break. And then when they come back, you can, okay, start with validating the emotion. You can say, hey, Billy, man, I see, it looks like you're having a tough day. I wonder what happened today, you know, or, hey, Billy, I see that you're, you're kind of feeling down right now. And I wonder what happened. You know, questions like that often don't elicit a negative response. Um, and again, you want to reflect on what you heard and you want to validate the emotion. Validating the emotion doesn't mean that you agree with the emotion. Validating the emotion means that you acknowledge that this is what is happening. All right, so as we move on, I'm going to focus on being there and being present with your kid. So here are some general guidelines. And the big thing is we all know, I'm sure we've all been in fights with our significant others or with our family or with our friends. Words make a really big difference. And when it comes to interacting with our kids, if they're feeling anxious or if they're feeling stressed, it really is the same thing. So instead of using good or bad, I would really recommend that you use healthy, unhealthy, or safe, or unsafe. And here are some reasons why. Using good and bad implies judgment. And for one reason or another, kids often lean towards the negative when good and bad is used. Using healthy, unhealthy, safe and unsafe, don't elicit a negative emotional response. So here's an example that I've often uh, seen in my sessions. I'll have a um, kid comes in and I'm doing the parent session and the kid is isolating in the room, right? And the mom says, why are you doing such a bad thing? You know, the reality is isolating feeling depressed is not a bad thing. It's not, he's not doing anything bad. It's not a healthy response to feeling anxious or feeling depressed, but it's not a bad thing. And so when we use good and bad, it often, kids often mean they get that confused with who they are. Instead of focusing on the action, they often take that to mean I'm a bad person, which of course parents don't mean to communicate that, but that's what the kids hear oftentimes. Instead of agreeing or disagreeing with emotions, you want to validate the feeling. I probably said validate like three or four times already. So hopefully you guys are picking up on the importance of validating emotions. Validating emotion implies understanding and recognition. Validating emotions also communicate to the child that you're on their side. Um, I had an example once where I had a kid that came in and uh, he was a freshman in high school and he just got dumped by his first girlfriend and he was super bummed out about it. You know, he would say things in the session like, man, I'm going to be alone and nobody ever is going to like me anymore. This is what they felt. My job in that moment wasn't to say, you know what, we'll call him Bobby. You know what, Bobby, that's not true. I'm sure you're going to find somebody. Well, yeah, I don't want to say that because I can't predict the future. And B, my job isn't to agree or disagree with him. My, my job is to validate and say, hey, man, yeah, it really stinks to get dumped. You know, I can really see how that's painful. And then let's talk about it, right? Focusing on the present moment. It's not about you're right or you're wrong. It's about acknowledging what's happening. And last but not least, instead of giving answers, you want to focus on being present. Don't feel like you have to fix the problem because sometimes you're not able to fix the problem and that shouldn't be the goal. 
the goal should be to how can I help my child get through this difficult time? And being present lets them know that you are not, they are not alone in their anxiety. One of the big things with anxiety, especially if your kid struggles with panic attack or anxiety attacks or whatever they want to call them, um, is it, have, it kind of starts in their head, right? They might start to feel something and then in their head, they're kind of, the, right? It's like, oh, it's like a snowball effect, right? It's, the snowball starts rolling down the hill and then before you know it, it's really, really big. And so what happens, instead of giving an answer, it's being present, you let your child know they're not alone in their anxiety. So if you're seeing your kid having a hard time because you can pick up on the body language, you can uh, say, hey, let's focus on being present in the moment. You can acknowledge, hey, I see that you might be having a tough time right now. I can see you might be upset. Do you want to talk about it, right? It's not about let's fix this. It's about, hey, look, I'm on your side and I can see that you're struggling right now. So hopefully those kind of three easy uh, things kind of make sense for you guys as we kind of continue and move towards understanding and using healthy coping skills. So I'm going to go over a few coping skills. And again, I don't know if there's any parents, if there's any kids who are watching. If there are some kids who are watching, you guys can practice with your child after we get done. Um, one big thing with coping skills is I often recommend that you practice them when you are calm, when the child is calm. It's about being proactive and not being reactive. If you don't practice the coping skills ahead of time, when your kids is in distress or is having a difficult time, it's going to be it's going to be hard for them to actually slow down and learn a new skill. So if you practice with them ahead of time, if you normalize it with them, then you can def you can move into a area of uh, oh hey this is not a new concept let's try this as you're upset. So this coping skill is called five four three two one, and believe it or not, I actually use this oftentimes. I work at uh, another hospital. And when there's a crisis in the hospital, this is a skill that I would use with grownups. You know, my tone of voice might change, my body language might change, but the concept is really the same. And so what this does is you focus on your five senses, right? You focus on five things you can see, right? You focus on four things you can hear. You focus on three things you can feel with your hands, uh, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So the big thing with this is if somebody is having anxiety, if somebody is in crisis, we want them to focus on being in the present moment. When kids are in distress or even grownups are in distress, it becomes a lot more difficult to focus on our emotions. Oh, I feel sad right now. Or I feel angry right now. The reality is a lot easier to focus on. What am I seeing? What am I physically feeling? What am I smelling? What am I hearing? So this is a skill that you can use with your uh, kids. And again, the key is about being in the present moment. So here's an example of how you might be able to use this. Um, and you see your child struggling. Um, or if you can practice with them ahead of time, say you guys are in your living room and say, hey, buddy, I want you to learn this new skill. And you know what, mom and dad and you, we're all going to learn this together, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to alternate uh, pointing out one thing that we see, right? So I'm going to say, I can see a lamp. And then maybe the uh, mom says, I can see a picture frame. And the kid says, oh, I see a couch. You know, it's about focusing on what is in the present moment. So five things you see. Four things you hear is, okay, oh, I can hear the cars outside, or I can hear the dog barking, or sometimes if it's really quiet, when I'm teaching this in a therapy office, it tends to be kind of quiet, and so sometimes I might play a song, and I ask the kid to see if they can recognize what song I'm playing. Uh, three, th uh, three things you can feel, right, is with your hands, right? So maybe I can feel my phone, or maybe I can, you know, feel the monkey, and sometimes you can ask your child to describe, uh, what are you feeling? Oh, this feels kind of fluffy or, you know, this feels kind of cold. Uh, two things you can smell. Again, if you're outside, you can kind of see what you can smell. Um, sometimes if you don't have anything, there's a candle, maybe some food you can, uh, some food that you can smell. And one thing you can taste, right? And so oftentimes uh, you can do candy or a piece of gum. I learned today from one of my clients, I was teaching the skill to ask them my own clients today, and I used the example of Skittles. You can take the original Skittles and you can put them in your mouth and see if you 
me notice a flavor. So I learned today that the red Skittles, even though they're different colors, they are technically the same flavor. I had no idea. So there you know, <laughs> some fun facts, right? Um, and the big thing with this is the order doesn't matter too much. Um, one thing you don't want to probably do is put two things you smell or one thing you taste up on top. So the example I would use this with uh, some of my uh, teenagers is what would happen is back when they were in school, if they felt anxious, they would say, hey, can I go to the bathroom? And they would go to the bathroom and they would like use the skill five, four, three, two, one. I probably don't want them to be eating anything in the bathroom. I don't want them to be smelling five things in the bathroom because it's probably not gonna make them feel better, right? So again, the order doesn't matter too much, but you wanna keep the what you can smell and what you can taste lower to the bottom. All right, so these two skills are really also important. This is the first one is called four square breathing. And what you do is you wanna imagine an imaginary square. And what you do is you inhale for four seconds and then you hold your breath for four seconds. You exhale over four, four seconds. And then you repeat this process four different times. And so if you're doing this with your child, what you might wanna do is you're gonna, count for your kid and you're going to ask them to count or uh, if you have a younger child they can't maybe hold their breath for four seconds you can modify this to triangle breathing so triangle breathing is the same concept but instead of four is three and so you can count for your child okay bobby i'm going to have you i'm going to count to four with my fingers and i want you to inhale for four seconds right and so we go one I can't obviously talk and inhale at the same time, but you count for four seconds. All right, Bobby, I want you to hold your breath. Okay, you're gonna hold your breath for four seconds, and now I'm gonna exhale over four seconds, and now we're gonna do this four times. So then it's called four square breathing. And this other skill is called color breathing. And so color breathing is all about using distraction, right? And so how this works is you pick a positive color that has a, a a happy meaning to you. So for me, sky blue is a positive color because it makes me think of the sun being out. It makes me think of warm weather. So as I inhale, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to think of the color blue and think about all the things associated with color blue. Maybe I'll think of a fun vacation that I went on with my family or with my friends. And then as I exhale, I'm going to think of a color that I don't like. So I don't like lime green because it makes me think of having a stomach ache. So I'm going to think as I'm exhaling, I'm going to think of that color and some of the, uh, you know, emotions associated with that. So the concept with this is positive energy in and then kind of negative energy out. The cool thing with all of these coping skills is you can modify it to meet your needs, to meet your child's needs. Sometimes with color breathing, I have clients who don't like thinking about negative color. So what we do is we think about positive color in positive color out. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being able to modify this. Um, and so, again, the big thing with breathing is by slowing down your breathing by distraction, right? What we know from science is that oftentimes what causes anxiety to increase is when we start to have physiological symptoms, right? We might get a stomach ache, we might feel our heart pounding, we might start to breathe faster. So what we know from science is that if we slow down our breathing, we know that our heart rate will slow down, which is going to help kind of equalize what's going on inside our body. And so one way we can focus on this is by activating the right side of our brain. So our left side is kind of where our anxiety is. And when we use task oriented things, like if we're writing or if we're doing a task or if we're counting, that's actually on the right side of our brain. You can't both have your left side and your right side activated at the same time. So as you use five, four, three, two, one, as you use four square breathing, as you use color breathing, what's happening is we're asking you or your child to lower that left side by focusing on the right side. And that really helps with the, just the lowering the anxiety component. All right, so some things that, there are some five general guidelines that, uh, I know I kind of went through a lot of information in this short amount of time. And so here are some five key takeaways and five things I want you guys to remember. If you forget everything, that's okay. Focus on these five things. One is remember you're not perfect and that is okay. We all know that 2020 has been a really tough year. 
we don't know what the future holds and it's okay not to have the answers. And the big thing is you can actually model to your child, you know what, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I get upset, sometimes I get anxious and that's okay. You know, when your kid knows that you're not perfect, they don't have that false expectation of I have to be perfect, right? So you get to model to your child that it's okay not to be perfect and that's okay. Your child is not looking for you to be a superhero. They're looking for you to be a star, right? And so it's being responsive, it's being timely, it's being supportive, and it's being present in the moment. Uh, three is show your child how to use coping skills and practice with them. Again, if you have a younger kid, you can make it really goofy, right? Sometimes uh, learning, you know, you know, coping skills can kind of be boring, but there's nothing that says it has to be boring. You get to modify this however you want to do this. And if you practice with your child, if you model to your child, hey buddy, watch mom and dad do this, right? Or, you know, watch grandma and grandpa do this and see if you can remember how much of it you can remember. You get to practice with them and that way they will be able to uh, engage more and it will be a more enjoyable experience for them. Uh, four is coping skills do not make problems go away. They can help shift focus. Again, the big thing is really about not focusing on can I fix the problem? The goal is about what can I do to actually help the child get through something. So an example I use, again, another metaphor is surfing, right? So if we think about somebody surfing and they're in one of those big barrel waves, right? They're in the, they're on the surfboard, they're in the wave. You know, they're in the wave, they can't really do anything to get out of it, right? So they have to go through the wave, right? Um, and so the goal then becomes is how can they actually go through the wave and not wipe out? So maybe they have to move their hands in a different way. Maybe they have to change their positioning on the surfboard so that way they don't wipe out, right? As a parent, you're not going to be able to make that wave go away. But what you can do by being proactive, by practicing with your child is you can give them the skills they need to know. So that way, as they're on the surfboard, they're not going to wipe out. They're not going to get overwhelmed as they see the water kind of getting close to them. And they'll be able to get through the wave in a, in a more healthy way. And then as they look back, they'll say, oh, look, I was able to do it. And last but not least is focus on the, the present moment and validate your child's emotion. Uh, again, anxiety is often caused by um, if we get stuck in the past or if we worry about the future, we can't control any of those. And so focusing on the present moment can help our child be here, present, and not worry about something that is outside of their control. And obviously validating your emotion, we've talked about that quite a lot. It's not about being right or wrong, it's about being able to acknowledge what your child is feeling and going from there. All right, so now it kind of gives us some time for question and answers. Um, we'll kind of start uh, with Terry. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Alex. Your presentation yeah. was so helpful. Um, the first question I have for you is my son has ADHD and ODD and is starting to refuse to attend school or pay attention to school. He's playing instead of or watching YouTube. Nothing I do is motivating him. Even threatening him isn't working. What can I do? Yeah, that is a great question. So threatening is something that doesn't often work. Uh, what we know if, through research and studies is that negative consequences are never enough to sustain positive long-term change. The goal is really about the positive of engaging in school when that outweighs the positive of not being in school or doing school or doing chores. Um, when that positive of the healthy choice outweighs the positive of the unhealthy choice. One thing I would recommend you do is you want to make your child feel like they have some sense of control. And what you can actually, the way I do this is you give them options of here, you, you get to pick, you get to make this choice. So for example, like if the thing is, hey buddy, you have to go to, you have to get on Zoom and you have to do this class, right? And so and you can say, so you get to pick if you make that choice. And if you make choice option A, this is going to be a positive reward. The positive reward might be you get to play five minutes of video games or 10 minutes of video games versus the negative cause. The negative is if you don't do this, we're going to subtract the time. So oftentimes I'll have parents come up with my kid can spend two hours on 
uh, video games. And so then it becomes a, if you do what you're supposed to do, the time goes up. So you start from zero. And if you don't do what, you know, so say they clean their room so they get 10 minutes, right? And say they go to one class and get another 20 minutes, right? And say they don't go to class three and then you can subtract 10 minutes. Again, it doesn't have to be five, 10 minutes, but the idea is you allow your child to feel like they have some sense of making a choice because the reality is as they get older, they can make unhealthy choices as well. And we can't force our kids to do something. I definitely don't ever encourage parents to get into a power struggle over every single little thing. So one way you can avoid the power struggle is by saying, all right, um, how can we empower you to make choices, right? So you have choices, you can either make a healthy choice or you can make an unhealthy choice. Um, and depending on what you choose will have a different consequence to it, either a positive consequence or a negative consequence. Um, but definitely the video gaming aspect, that's something that is really difficult. And the other great thing I would say, if there's uh, two parents in the home or if, uh, is making sure that both mom and dad or both parents are on the same page with uh, what's happening. Because often what can happen is if the kid goes to one parent, they say one thing, they go to another parent, and that way the parent, the kid will split the parents. And so really what I encourage you guys to do is talk with each other before we kind of come up with a plan of what we can do, how we can move forward so you guys are both on the same page. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry, Terry. There we go. Be better at this. <laughs> <laughs> is it helpful to name anxiety to our children? to help them understand some of their feelings stem from anxiety? That is a really good question. And I think it is. Uh, one of the reasons being is that, the, as we probably all know, there's a lot of stigma on mental health, right? One of the words that we're starting to use is emotional well-being, right? Because we know there's so much stigma. And sometimes your kid doesn't know what anxiety is, right? Especially if mom or dad or grandma or grandpa have struggled with anxiety and you can understand. And oftentimes parents can look at their kids and they can see, whoa, like I remember, like it's like, it's almost like you're looking at yourself being a 10 year old or a 12 year old or 15 year old. And so you recognize, hey, this is what anxiety is. So when you say, hey, I wonder, this is what it is. When I was your age, this is what anxiety looks like for me. And so what you're doing is you're actually modeling to your child, talking about emotions, talking about not being perfect, and you're giving them the vocabulary. The thing is, is kids can feel all the same emotions that we can feel from a very young age. They can feel scared, they can feel confused, they can feel happy, they can feel excited. But what happens is they don't have the actual cognitive ability to put words to feelings. And so part of your job as a parent is you can help them use that language. You don't wanna go into this whole, hey, WebMD says if you have this, you have anxiety. What you wanna do is speak, uh, speak from personal experience and you wanna normalize it. But yeah, that's definitely a healthy thing to do is be able to give your words, your kids the words to use to put the emotion to the uh, behavior. I noticed that my child is spending more and more time in their room. Is there anything I can do about that? Yeah, so definitely what, uh, there are different things you can do if you're noticing that. So one example is depending on, do they have the electronics in their room? I actually just have a 14 year old kid I'm working with and I'm doing family sessions and I've been working with mom and dad on, hey, we really have to get the computer system out of their room. Um, especially with online school, if they're spending all day in their room for the different Zoom classes or Google Meetup classes, that's really not a good thing. So one thing you can do is definitely look at, can I remove the computer from the room? Can I remove PlayStation, Xbox? Can I put it in a different room in my house? The other thing you can do is put limits on how much time they're spending um, on their phone or on their social media. Most likely if they're in their room, they're probably engaging in one of those. And so being able to make a rule of, hey, you can be in your room for one hour, and if, if your room, your phone has to stay out here. The big thing with the phone is uh, it really helps a lot if you start to implement some of these boundaries really young. It's a lot more difficult to implement boundaries like putting time limits on things, 
um, if your kid's like 17 or 16. Um, another big thing you can do if they're going to get into a massive power struggle with uh, moving something out of the room. Again, you have to make sure that you're on the same on the same pair uh, on the same page as your spouse or your significant other. And so then what happens is you can put a limitation on the internet. So the internet is going to go off at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock. Um, and kind of that's kind of more like a later stop if your child is really kind of giving you a hard time with that. I think my child might benefit from talking to a counselor, but he, but how do his mom and I get him to buy into therapy? He's saying he does not want to go. Yes, good question. So I've definitely had clients where uh, the parent will come in and they say, my kid doesn't want to be here, go ahead and fix them. And they don't quite say it like that, but that's pretty much the message that I get. And I often put, tell parents and their kids is my job not to fix anybody. So one thing you can do with your child, again, it's about giving them a sense of ownership and a sense that they have a, cho a choice to make in this. So say um, you guys uh, have decided, hey, we really want you to go to therapy because we're seeing some of this anxiety that we've seen in our lives when we were younger. And so instead of just telling them, hey, we're gonna pick a therapist for you, you can be like, hey, so mom and I decided that we want you to go to therapy. Um, and so what we want you to do is you get to pick who you wanna see. You know, so what you can do ahead of time is make sure you call your insurance and then you can pick maybe two or three practices that are in network with your uh, provider. And then you can tell your child, hey, look, here are three practices, right? And so I know for our website, you can click on our website, you can go to staff and you can engage the child and you have 45 people you get to pick from. Let's go through this together. Let's see who do you wanna go through. You can see a picture, you can see a little bio on what they focus on. You can um, focus on, oh, hey, maybe I wanna see, you know, Alex, or maybe I wanna see Kelly. You know, and so that's one thing. You know, if you if you notice your kid's like, okay, I'll go, but there's a lot of anxiety, you can work with your kid on, hey, let's see if there are some questions that you might want to ask your therapist, right, or your counselor. And so you work with them ahead of time to come up with questions that they might have in terms of, um, hey, what's the therapist like, or you know, stuff like that. So that way they feel like they get to know their therapist. So that would be one thing that I would definitely recommend is empower your child and enable your child to make the choice of who they want to see. They don't really have the option of, you can't go because mom and dad said you have to go, right? But you get to pick who you want to see. You engage them and you involve them in the process of finding the therapist. Alex, do you have any recommendations um, for students who are, or, sorry, children who are getting into more fights with their siblings with all this togetherness? Yes. So then I've, we've definitely seen that across our practice. Um, so one of the big things I would say with that is finding alone time, right? So that's a really big one. So one thing is if there's a dog, if there's a pet, is becoming and building in, building a routine where going outside, doing something becomes a new expectation. One of the big things I use with clients is creating a new normal. Uh, oftentimes when people come to therapy, I hear them say, hey, I want to go back to how, how things were. And I often ask, well, do you really? Because how, how things were got you here. So why would we want to go back to how you got here? Let's create a new normal. Let's create a new healthy normal, right? And as we kind of talk, I know Tara and I, you and I were mad about this kind of new school year, this new normal. We don't know what the future is going to hold, right? And so as we recognize this new normal, we want to create new routines and new habits. And so one thing you can do is say, okay, on the hour or maybe in the five minute break that we have between uh, your Zoom classes, right? We're going to actually go around the house, right? If we can't walk around the block because we only have five minutes, I want you to run around the house twice, right? Or I want you to walk around the house twice. So if that's a dog, you know, take, I have a little, you know, dog, her name is Brandy. Okay, we're gonna have you take Brandy and walk around the house, right? So that's one thing you can do in terms of building your routine, create some alone time. The other big thing I would say is acknowledge what you're seeing again. And you can, I think oftentimes parents feel like 
they see their kids fighting and they, they might not say something, they just respond to the behavior. But there's a lot of value in saying, hey guys, I'm noticing you guys are fighting quite a lot more. You don't have to go into detail. You don't have to have a 45 minute conversation of detailing all these different fights. But what you're doing is you're verbalizing a behavior that you're seeing with the goal of we hopefully the kid become more aware of that behavior. Um, so that you build a routine, verbalize what you're seeing. Um, those are probably the two big things I would say. And then if you can, build a long time. So in terms of like mom's going to spend some alone time with one kid, you know, dad's going to spend some alone time with another kid. It doesn't have to be, you know, you know, some going to the movies or some 45 minutes and it could be, hey buddy, this is football walk, just you and I, you know, oh, hey, hey, let's, uh, maybe we can play a video game together for 20 minutes, something like that, kind of building that alone time with each individual sibling. So here's another question for you. I have a seventh grader and her anxiety has gotten worse during the pandemic. Is there anything else I can do to help her? Yes, that is a pretty good question. So again, I think one of the big things is focusing on helping her understand that she's not alone in anxiety. So often what I do with kids who have anxiety and parents, I have them use kind of like a code language or code, code words, right? And so when, you know, back when things were kind of a bit more open, say somebody would go out to a restaurant, right? And the kid, the parent recognizes that the kid is anxious, right? And then the parent might be like, oh, hey, are you feeling anxious right now? And the kid's like, stop asking me. People are looking at me. Why are you asking me if I'm anxious, right? That might make the kid's anxiety go increase. And so what I would do with, and I have one family come up with, uh, they use weather as their cold question, right? And so what they would do is, if they were out in public, they would say something like, hey, what do you think the weather's going to be like, right? And then the kid has the creativity to say, oh, I feel like it's going to get really windy. Or I feel like it's going to get really cold. Or I feel like it's going to get very, you know, like I feel like, you know, it's going to get really warm, you know. And so then what happens is a kid and a child are communicating to each other about what they might be feeling using unique language that nobody else is really going to be able to recognize, right? And so I can... This also kind of initiates that creativity aspect, right? So ahead of time, you can even say, hey, what, you know, metaphors do you want to create? What, what analogies do you want to use? Oh, we can use the weather, or we can use cars. I had a kid who was on an autism spectrum and they use cars, right? And so then they go in public, he used uh, the, he would use a monster truck when he felt like really, really, like he, was, he wanted to hit something, right? And of course, this took quite a while for the parents to kind of come up with this and this to become a routine and then he used I think he used like a van like a minivan as like when he felt bored uh because he didn't like me he didn't like his uh, parents minivan because they were you know and then he used like a viper and when he felt like he had a lot of energy and he wanted to run around right and so they would kind of ask him about hey what car do you feel like you want to be you are right now so instead of focusing on I feel angry I feel mad because again the kid couldn't really verbalize that but he really loved cars he knew a lot about the cars. And so he, they were able to take his strength and take that into how can we take that into emotions and talking about what you're feeling and how you can communicate what you're feeling. So you can, yeah, use a unique question and language to kind of help express what anxiety is. That's all the questions that we've received tonight, unless anyone has something else they want to type into the chat. Meg, did you have any questions for Alex this evening? No, I thought it was great. I thought you gave a lot of really good practical um, information for all of the attendees. Awesome, cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Again, I love doing stuff like this. Uh, I know that, uh, Terry, when you and I were talking earlier is the coping skills that I went over here, I will forward you because we have a PDF files of these. So that way uh, you guys will be able to share them across your social media and your platforms. And that way, if you, you, if you have a parent who wants to use that, you'll be able to download and then print it and kind of be able to use that. So that will be some information for you guys to kind of take home after this as well. Thank you. So for everyone online, we'll be posting a copy of this webinar, as well as the, that PDF that Alex is going to send my way 
to our Schomburg Parent University website. Again, that is sd54.org slash SPU. So um, if you enjoyed the presentation and you wanna refer back to it, try some of the strategies with your children or refer a friend, uh, please let them know that it'll be on the website uh, most likely as soon as tomorrow. Thank you all for enjoying, for joining us this evening. <laughs> And thank you, Alex, for giving us your time and your expertise to help our families of District 54. Awesome. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>